bringing a full cessation to the tears and it's just joy going forward. He says your life will be an embodiment of the, the meaning of that name. What's the, what's the meaning of the name? Yeah, that's what it's going to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the last miracle service, we, we spent time, you know, I, I couldn't teach much because it was almost as if every time I wanted to teach, I was interrupted by a word of knowledge or a, a word of prophecy. I have begged God because teaching is important. All right. One of the basic determinants of the depth of a Christian life really is the level of teaching that that life has received and imbibed. One of the basic determinants of how do you know a Christian is he, a Christian life is deep. Um, a Christian life is deep because of how much that life has received and imbibed. Listen, let me tell you something. It won't matter the number of experiences and encounters you have had with God if there is no teaching foundation to give context to your experiences, those experiences will create a problem for you. And so like Samuel and Eli, it might not matter how many times you hear God call your name in your left ear. If you don't know already by teaching how to say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. It won't matter the experience you had. Do you understand? And so it's easy for us to come for meetings and say, um, give me an encounter with you. But many times an encounter with God is made meaningful by our knowledge of God. In fact, when encounters with God are not guardrailed or shepherded by a proper knowledge of God, what you have is... When there seems to be an opposing encounter, all of the previous encounters will just crash. And so you see people who have, you hear the stories all the time, people who have been in great meetings, they've seen miracles happen, God has walked and moved in their lives, and then one tough season of their life came, and then you start to hear things like, I don't believe God exists. Then they chalk up the miracles to placebo effect, and all those other strange things that people say. And that's because when the word of God doesn't shape the encounters we have, the encounters we have become very dangerous. You need to understand that in the realm of the spirit, the realm of the spirit is split into two. You know, when we talk about the spiritual realm, most people just think that the spiritual realm is totally encompassed by God and his angels. There, there is also the devil and his cohorts. And so spiritual encounters can come from any one of those two. In Acts chapter 16, there was a lady, the Bible tells us that she had a spirit of divination. She walked around with Paul and um, I think it was Silas. And she proclaimed that these are God's men who have come to tell you the truth about God. What she was saying was correct. Is that true? Yeah, what she was saying was correct. But underlying that encounter was a false spirit. And so many times in this kingdom, the, me, the end does not justify the means. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes, the miracles don't justify the source. This is why proper Bible teaching is important. Proper Bible teaching becomes very important. Hello guys, what's going on? All your whispering is disturbing me. Mediocrity in Christianity is not necessarily a function of lack of encounters, but rather it's a function of the lack of appropriate knowledge to give context to encounters. So listen, you might be a great Christian in sense of encounters. I mean, you see angels every other morning. As you just wake up, there's one holding coffee. Good morning. Here's your morning coffee. The next one, what, what do you want to do today? Let's plan your schedule. You might have all of those encounters and still be a mediocre Christian. I think it's a problem because a lot of people have not properly defined deep. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I might come out and stand and start giving you some of the encounters I've had with angels and people will say, mm, a man of God is deep. He sees angels on the regular. I do. 
<laughs> but that's not what makes me deep. The depth of God's word determines the depth of a man's life. So how skilled are you at handling the things of God based on your knowledge of the word of God? Another reason why this is important is it won't matter what you have if you don't know that you have it. Do you understand? Have you ever found 500 naira in your pocket at a time when you needed it? You just, you just, you know, one season where the power of God was moving around and so everybody had to fast, you know, compulsory fasting because the money is not plenty like that. And then one day you just wear one trouser, put your hand in the pocket, you feel paper. And then somewhere of your mind, you are hoping this is not receipts or that I left my, this is actually money. You bring it out and it's 500. And you are excited. Do you know what is interesting? There were periods when you were hungry in that house. 500 naira was in that pocket in that house. But you were hungry. Because it won't matter how much you have if you don't know that you have it. So it then begins to seem like the miracles become a joke if you don't know the significance of the miracles. Do you understand? Yes. You know, you've probably heard a pastor somewhere share this story. And because I'm a pastor, we share it too. We are in the same WhatsApp group, we share the same stories. About the man who boarded a boat, used all his life savings to buy tickets. You've heard that story before, haven't you? He used all his life savings to buy the ticket. And he was going somewhere, paradise, wherever it was. And then for three days, the journey was supposed to last. And he didn't have any money to eat. And so he decided he would starve. He would just stay in his room because he was too um, shy to beg. And so he stayed in his room the first day, the second day, the third day he fainted. They rushed this guy to the infirmary. The nurses looked at him and they said, nothing is wrong with this guy. He's just hungry. They woke him up, gave him food to eat and asked him, why didn't you eat? He said, I didn't have any money to eat. And they said, well, when you paid for the ticket, you paid for all your meals. It didn't matter that in that ticket was all the meals that he needed to eat. If he didn't know, it wouldn't have mattered. That's why Bible teaching is important. In fact, I think it is the most important aspect of Christian devotion. Because it is on the foundation of Bible teaching that you learn how to pray. You know in Nigeria, prayer is by instinct. So you have a three-year-old who just started talking, that's why he has your turn to lead prayers. What does he know? What does he know? And so because he has heard, he say, bless my mommy, bless my daddy, bless, I want to thank God for my mommy, my daddy, and everyone that gave birth to me, you know. So, good Bible teaching will form the vocabulary of your prayers. Do you understand? Yes. It will form the vocabulary of your prayers. There are some things that, when you have been taught properly in scripture, you just won't say when you are praying again. Some routes you won't go at all. I mean, how do you want to open your mouth and pray some prayers when um, you've read scriptures like where... Um, Peter and his brother went into a city to preach. Um, and was it Peter? No, it was um, James and John, the sons of thunder. They went into a city to preach and then they came out of that city and then they chased them out. And then they came to Jesus and said, let us call down fire upon them. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. How do you have that Bible knowledge and still feel comfortable with everybody attacking my destiny? What are you waiting for? Die. Good Bible knowledge must form the vocabulary of your prayers. Do you understand? And just like every other spiritual reality, it won't matter the benefits that salvation has afforded you if you don't know what salvation is. But let me take a detour here and talk about something. This means that your approach to receiving knowledge must be different it must be different write this down when it comes to bible doctrine 
your instinct to learn must overcome your instinct to be right your instinct to learn must overcome or override your instinct to be right you know that instinct to be right nobody likes to be wrong nobody likes to get it wrong but your instinct to learn proper doctrine must override your instinct to be right what this means is that when you hear something you haven't heard before your first response shouldn't be are you now trying to say that do you understand that shouldn't be your first response at all your first response should be can you show me from scripture if you've looked at it let me take some time to study this do you understand you know I had there was a season of my life when I was a Facebook theologian it's not a very nice thing to be it's um, people who debunk you know you just find one new rema and you just go on Facebook when Facebook was still a thing it still is some people are on Facebook I don't know why but <laughs> when Facebook was still a thing and then you share this rumor and then once you share you just start receiving all are you trying to say what are you now trying to say you yeah. and you know a lot of people don't know how to disagree in this country some people just outrightly say you are very foolish <laughs> what did I do to warrant the name calling and, and um you know, sometimes people would argue like that and I would take my time to explain from scripture how you are wrong. And then when a lot of people see that they are no longer winning this argument, they result to two things, insult and emotional blackmail. Are you trying to say, first of all, they will insult you, you are a fool. Or you are, you are, you are an illiterate. Go and read your Bible and learn. I, I just showed you the Bible. No, go and read your Bible. Then secondly, these are things that fathers have glimpsed and gleaned. Are you trying to say that you are better than the fathers? That are... When it comes to knowledge, this is the beautiful thing about Bible knowledge. It's like light and darkness. It doesn't matter for how long a room has been in darkness. When light comes, darkness must go. Do you understand? Now the other interesting thing about light and darkness is it doesn't matter who put on the light. Do you understand? Yes. So, a room might have been in darkness for 10 years and a 3-year-old stumbles into the room with torchlights. The 10-year-old darkness must give way for the 3-year-old's light. Praise the Lord. Listen, this is not ground for dishonor. There is, and that's some generation we grossly lack honor. So, you, because you are correcting something a father has said, you now... These men know that they don't know everything. And I think, I think that's where they are better than us. Because you would be very misguided to think that you know everything. These men know they don't know everything. And so when something that they don't know, it's possible for them to listen. But when you now say, it doesn't matter who said it. They are false prophets. False. You know, I've heard that before. Your approach towards knowledge must be different. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm saying this because at Circle Church, we're a Bible-believing church, Bible-teaching church, and we emphasize on the Bible very much. I mean, it becomes difficult to have some conversations because we don't just say, this is the accepted public knowledge. We try as much as possible to glean from Scripture what the Bible teaches. And that's what every Christian must do. I'm sure you've heard of the Berean Christians before. And you've, you've been told about how they were more honorable than others just because they took time to do what every Christian must do. Having said that, I want us to do a conversation on salvation. Hallelujah. We're going to learn a little bit about salvation. I, I think... This conversation is important because this is the one subject that almost every Christian thinks they have a grip on. But most Christians don't. 
Yeah. Have, let me tell you what will expose this um, deficiency, um, this lack, this deficiency in knowledge. If you go out on evangelism, if you go out on evangelism, the things you will hear, the things you will hear. I remember in, in 2016, I went out to evangelize, and then I was I was evangelizing in Ogun State, <laughs> and I got to this particular lady's shop, and I walked into her shop. And I said, are you a Christian? And she said, yes. I said, oh, okay, that's great. Because before I started evangelizing, I want to know, are you a Christian? Or are you, are you with us or are you against us? So that we'll know what we're saying and what we're doing. You know what I mean? Are you a Christian? She said, yes. Oh, great. What church do you go to? Oh, she doesn't go to church. So how are you a Christian? She said, um, what, okay, what religion do you practice? She said, sometimes Christianity, sometimes Islam, wherever she finds herself. She's married to a Muslim she was raised in a Christian background so sometimes she goes to church sometimes she goes to mosque I'm, I promise you that I'm not making this up and then I said so why did you say you are a Christian she said because we are all children of God I said what informed this decision this conclusion that you came to she said that she be, they said we are the world we are the children I kid you not I heard this when I went out to evangelize you know who said we are the world we are the children yeah, Michael Jackson. She was quoting Michael Jackson for her eternal life. <laughs> I found it very ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't know where to start from. So I start, and you know, <laughs> and so a lot of people think they have one thing I like to do when I go out to evangelize is, are you saved? They say yes. From what? <laughs> now we're all stuck because we don't know the answer to that question. If I do it now, some of you will bite your tongues. Are you saved? Yes. From what? Sin. Sin? <laughs> Can the believer truly know that he is saved? Can the believer truly hit his chest in confidence that he is saved? And I want to start this teaching from John chapter 2. John chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11. You can, you can stop playing. You can actually just stop playing. John chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you there? Are you there? John chapter 2. We're reading 1 to 11. Actually, we won't read it because of time, but you know the story. It's the story of Jesus at the wedding in Cana. This is the first recorded miracle that Jesus ever did. There are seven miracles that Jesus did that were called Messianic miracles. What are the Messianic miracles? Miracles were not, Jesus did not institute miracles. Miracles happened before Jesus came. Is that correct? Good. So when you are talking about the Messianic miracles, you're talking about particular miracles that established his claim as the Messiah. Miracles that nobody else had done and nobody else could do. You know, they established his claim as the Messiah. There are seven of them. The opening of a blind eye. Nobody ever opened a blind eye before Jesus came. Um, the casting out of devils. Nobody ever did that before Jesus came. And then you have um, the healing of a leprous Jew leprous Israelites. Nobody ever did that before Jesus came. Um, you have the opening of deaf ears. Nobody ever did that before Jesus came. I even think um, on stopping of dumb, that's opening of the dumb mouth. Nobody did that before Jesus came. And one of them is actually turning water into wine. One of the Messianic miracles. So Jesus went for this particular wedding and then the wedding had progressed for long. And at some point in the wedding, his mother came to him and said, Oh, um, there's no wine. The people have, their wine has finished. I don't know why she did that. Because normally if wine should finish, you go to the market, right? <laughs> <laughs> but she came and she said, there's no wine. Their wine has finished. Help us, all of that. And Jesus, first of all, formed for her. Woman, my time has not come. But he, she being his mother, she knew him. So she turned to the disciples and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because I know he's for me now, but he's still going to do something. So. And so he turns to the disciples 
And this is the part I want you to pay attention to. And it says to them to take the six stone jars of water and um, go and serve the six stone jars of water. Now, what you probably missed, because in John's gospel, there is a lot of history and culture that just flies over our head when we are reading John's gospel. And so many times we don't understand what John is saying. So what you probably missed is this, that in Jewish culture, there was something called, um, it's, it's a Hebrew name, that's, it's called the mikveh, and it's a ritual washing. Like, so it's a washing rite that they used to perform. And sometimes they would perform it before weddings. All right. Sometimes they'll perform it before a wedding begins. And what they use to perform this ritual washing is um, what they call living water. So living water is actually just any water from a nat any naturally occurring body of water that flows. Do you understand? Do you understand that? Uh -huh. So they would fetch this living water. Now, they would fetch it in, according to Moses' laws from Deuteronomy, in a container that cannot be corrupted. So metal was out of the question because it rusts. Do you get? So they'll fetch it in stone jars. Are you getting it? They'll fetch it in these stone jars and carry them to the wedding place or wherever they're doing the bath for purification. And they'll keep the stone jars. Now, this is the interesting thing. If the stone jars were there, as at the time the mother came to say the wine has finished, it means that the wedding had commenced, is that correct? Which means that they had already washed with the water. Is that correct? <laughs> is that correct? Yes. And that was the water Jesus asked them. <laughs> he said, carry the water and go and serve it. And when they got there, the water had turned into wine. The significance can be lost on many other people, but for the Jew, you know, you read, are you at John chapter 2 verse, um, now I want you to read verse 11 together. Everybody wants to go. It says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his, and his disciples did what? So when the disciples saw this, they said, truly this is the Messiah. They believed in him. What was it about that miracle that represented or revealed the work that Jesus came on earth to do? It's simple. Up until then, the Jews trusted living water outside to wash them outwardly and clean them. But when Jesus turned that living water to wine, he did two things. He first of all said, number one, I will not wash you from outside, I will wash you from inside. Are you getting this? So your cleansing will not happen from the outward. It will happen from inside of you. So you are not made clean by pouring water on yourself. You are clean because there is something that you have inside of you that has changed your life. And then secondly, water had no ability to control the actions of people. Are you getting this? And they cleanse. You would still go and act according to your previous programming. But there is something that wine does that water cannot do. When a man has taken in wine, it controls your actions. Do you get it now? So um, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled, are you getting this, with the Spirit of God. And so what Jesus did in turning water to wine was give an announcement on how your cleansing will no longer happen by water, but by spirit. Are you getting this? So, in his very first miracle, he mirrored the salvation plan. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He mirrored his salvation plan. That I'm going beyond, I'm going beyond um, just washing you outside, which was what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist, and you can hear it in his words. John said, I baptize you in water, but there is one who comes who is mightier than I, whose shoes are not worthy to tie. He says, when he comes, he will baptize you in what? In the Holy Ghost. So, I have cleansed you up until now with living water, but there is one who comes that his cleansing will be much more than water does. Do you get it? His cleansing will go much farther than water has gone. He will do it by the Holy Spirit. And so I said, 
Salvation is the same as the receiving of the Holy Spirit. If the problem of man was sin, and the only way sin, um, Hebrews chapter 10, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Are you there? Are you there? He says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged, that's once cleaned, should no longer have conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, it says, there is a remembrance um, again made of sins every year. And then he goes on to talk on and on and on. And then um, he goes on to, let me see. I really didn't plan to quote from Hebrews 10. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. Let me see. And then he reads on to um, verse, verse, um, nine, verse 8. He says, okay, from verse 7. Then said I, lo, I am come in the volume of the book as it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither hast thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I am come to do thy will. He taketh away the first, which is the sacrifices, that he may establish the second. By the which will... Um, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He says, and every priest standeth ministering daily and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Everybody, verse 12, together wants to go. He says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of then on verse 13, it says, From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness for us. So the witness of your sanctification is the receiving of the Spirit. Are you getting this? Good. So the salvation experience is the same as receiving the Holy Spirit. Are you following? I'm saying this because... You know what problem I have noticed in the body of Christ is we have, um, we, we do this thing where we, quant, where we quantize information. So you hear this piece of information and you hear this other piece of information and you don't see how this piece of information affects this other piece of information. And so sometimes it has to be spelled out. You know this thing we do in the body of Christ where we do Holy Ghost baptism? Raise your hand if you've, if you've ever heard of it before. Holy Ghost baptism, where you have believed, you come out, you say, Lord Jesus, I accept you, or whatever you say to be saved. You come out, you say it, you are saved, and they now tell you, now that you have been saved, you need to go and receive the Holy Ghost in Holy Ghost baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It's not, it, is, it is logically inconsistent. Because you were saved by receiving the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? You were saved because the Holy Spirit came inside of you. But pastor, there are times when people have not been speaking in tongues. They are saved though they are Christians. But then we do Holy Ghost baptism for them and then they start to speak with tongues. What about that? What is happening when I call a man who has been saved and he doesn't speak with tongues and I lay hands on him and he starts to speak with tongues? It's not that I put the Holy Ghost inside of him. There was already the Holy Spirit inside of him. Do you understand? The reason why he can speak in tongues is because the Holy Spirit has been in him all the while. He just didn't know. So what we did was stir up a gift that was already inside. Do you get it? Ah, yes. That was all we did. We didn't baptize him with a new Holy Spirit or give him a new Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit when you believe. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You received the Holy Spirit when you believed. So salvation is Holy Ghost baptism. Salvation really is 
Holy Ghost baptism. You know, in John chapter 17, verse 17, um, let, let's, let's look at John chapter 17, verse 17. Um, J- Jesus was speaking. He says, sanctify them by the washing of the word. That word is truth. But in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said that, um, he says, um, it's not the words that save. He says, the spirit that gives life. He says, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So it is the Holy Spirit acting upon the word of God that does the sanctification. Are you getting it? So when Jesus prayed the prayer, sanctify them by the teaching of thy word, thy word is truth, John 17, he was actually telling us that when the Holy Spirit acts upon the word of God that people have received, it sanctifies them. And so a man cannot really be saved until the Holy Spirit has been received. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit is the effective sanctifying agent of the word of God, however you want to put that. It's the Holy Spirit that makes new. New birth experience is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We became born again by receiving the Spirit of God. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus came to meet Jesus. And he said, "Um, Master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, except a man is born again. He says, he will not see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus was confused, you know, because the, the term was new and strange. You know what I mean? It was new and strange. What do you mean by born again? I'm already born. can't be born twice. So Nicodemus asks Jesus, are you saying I should go back and insert myself into my mother's womb and be born anew? And Jesus said, no. He says, except a man be born of water, which is spirit. He says, he will not see the kingdom of God. And so being born again is being born of the spirit. And then, and then Nicodemus was more confused. <laughs> and so Jesus says, are you a teacher of the law? And you don't know these things. And so he starts to do a teaching on salvation. And he runs that teaching till we get to John chapter 3 verse 16, which is arguably the most famous um, verse of the Bible. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jesus to Nicodemus that except a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot receive the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus says, how can I be born of spirit? And he says, God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes will not perish. So how does a man receive the Holy Spirit. How, does, how is a man born of the Spirit? By believing. John chapter 3 verse 16. Are you getting this? That's how a man is born of the Spirit. That's how, so the salvation experience detailed in John chapter 3 verse 16 is the same salvation experience detailed in John chapter 3 verse 9. Or verse 6 actually. Praise the Lord. I'm taking my time to establish this because um, this is sort of like an introduction to the teaching. The, the main aspect of teaching is what I'm about to enter. But there's really no difference between being saved and Holy Ghost baptism. I, I just want to establish that. Amen? Amen. So if you are in the room and you don't speak in tongues, you have the Holy Ghost too. Do you know? You have the Holy Spirit. You do. You really do. You know, I, I, during the camp meeting, our last camp meeting last year, um, we finished or we just finished a morning prayer session. We're going to go into the second part of the morning prayer session. And then I came up to speak briefly because I had to minister somewhere that morning. And the Holy Ghost just led me to talk about people who weren't filled with the Spirit. And there was a lady there who I just told them stories how um, one time, some guy called me over the phone. It was over the phone. I didn't need to lay hands on him. Do you understand? He just called me, said he doesn't speak with tongues. He doesn't believe the, he has the Holy Spirit. I explained to him what I'm explaining to you now. How that um, when you believe, how you get saved is that you receive the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? So once you believe, what happens is that the, that the Lord sends the Holy Spirit to you. And then once you've received the Holy Spirit, you are saved. 
And when he understood that, I said, okay, so what's going to happen now is, um, then I talked to him a little bit about speaking in tongues, how um, a lot of people expect that um, the Holy Spirit to take your tongue and wag it, you know, produce sounds for you, you know, and then uh, until, until they feel that wagging, they, they're not... So I explained to him how, no, it's called utterance, which means that the Holy Spirit inspires for you to do the speaking. And he said, oh, really? I said, yes. I said, okay, so what, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray. I'm not praying for you. I'm just going to pray. All right? And then the Holy Spirit will inspire you to pray. Because that's the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit. You see, there was something that happened when Mary met Elizabeth when they were both pregnant. Mary was carrying Jesus and Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist. And when they met each other, the Bible says that the children in their bellies began to leap. There was something about the Holy Ghost that when one believer meets another believer, we are able to sharpen each other. Do you get what I'm saying? We're able to stir each other to good works. It's the work of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been in a period where you don't feel like praying? Then you just hear someone praying, and then it just stirs you to pray. Yes. It's the work of the Spirit. So many times what many people call Holy Ghost baptism is just stirring other people to good works. Also, you have not been praying in tongues, that's fine. I know one thing for sure. If I pray in tongues beside you, I trust the Holy Ghost inside of you to give you a chance. Yes. Because it's the same Spirit, you see. But a man cannot really be saved if he doesn't have the Holy Ghost. There is no such thing as a saved man that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as it pertains to salvation, the Holy Spirit has three primary responsibilities. The first is cleansing. The first is cleansing. The second, or you can say cleansing and adoption. Cleansing and adoption. The second is leading and regulation. Or leading and regulating, however you want to write that. Leading and regulating. And then the third is sealing and assuring. Sealing, not sealing as in C-E-I-L-I-N-G, but sealing as in S-E-A-L-I-N-G, to seal, to seal something. These are the three primary and most important responsibilities of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer as it pertains to salvation. The first one is cleansing and adoption. Praise the Lord. And um, I've, I've spoken extensively about how it is the Holy Spirit that cleanses. It's the Holy Spirit that makes clean. Listen, he is called... You know, there's this thing, there's this doctrine or teaching that was popularized, you know, when our parents, you know, in the older generations. Brother, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be saved? You have to first denounce your ways and live a life that proves to God that you are worthy of his spirit. It's true. So they tell you, that if you used to steal, you must quit stealing first and quit smoking first. Quit womanizing first before you can receive the Holy Spirit. Brother, he is called the Holy Spirit because he's the spirit that makes holy. Do you understand? If you could be holy without the Holy Spirit, there would be no need for the Holy Spirit. Do you get it? Ah, yes. Yes. So, Jesus says it like this. He says, whose fan in his, is in his hands? He says, he will thoroughly purge the floor. Do you get it now? He will thoroughly purge the floor. He says, the axe is laid to the root, and every tree that my father did not plant, he says, is uprooted. He says, it will be gathered, and it will be burnt with unquenchable fire. And then the Holy Spirit, with the fan in his hands, says, he will purge the floor. So there is something the Holy Spirit does when he comes into the life of a believer and it is that he first cleanses the person. It's true. It's true. 
You know that place where you have been, where you consistently try your best to please God by your own actions, you don't get it. That's not your own responsibility. Your responsibility is to partner with the Holy Spirit as he's sweeping, don't be dead in. Do you get it? Ah, yes, but allow him to do the sweeping. Because the, the picture a lot of people have is the, um, the axe was laid to the root of the tree. They cut down the tree. They burnt the tree. The Holy Spirit carries the broom. He wants to sweep it out. And you're like, no, now ah, you are my senior partner. Let me do the sweeping. And so we keep making New Year resolutions that don't lead us anywhere. Amen. Amen. Thank God God doesn't take us seriously sometimes. <laughs> Say, God, if I lie this year, smite me. January 1st. January 1st, 6.30 p.m., you have lied. That's dead to straight death. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to cleanse. It is not your own responsibility to cleanse. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to cleanse. The first thing he does when he comes into the life of... Listen, he's a spirit of order. Are you getting what I'm saying? The introduction we have to the Holy Spirit is that he brought order. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And he says, darkness covered the face of the deep, but then the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, then God said. So the Holy Spirit acts upon the word of God in the life of a person to bring what? Order. He acts upon the word of God in the life of a person to bring cleanliness. To bring purity, holiness. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And this just leads us to number two. Where he leads and regulates. There is a conversation on the leading of the spirit that is not as popular as it should be. But in the scriptures, it is the major context of the, of the leading of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Yes. But you know, most times when you hear the leading of the Spirit, what you are expecting is, um, like um, the bishop heard, you say, God, I just read about your leading. Show me where to go. Then you say, go forward. It's okay. I'm going forward. Make a left. That's the leading of the Spirit a lot of people are used to. And the funny thing is this. All the scriptures we used to teach that, teach about something else. <laughs> Let's look at them. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Is this room too cold? Is it too cold? Can I go yes, I go no. Because this place where I'm standing is very cold. Ha. Ha ha. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 14. Actually, let's read verse 14 first. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There is nothing you cannot do. There's no mountain you cannot move. If you have said it, then you will do it. You have a track record of keeping your word. And you're not about to stop doing it now. Oloru Agbaye, oh, you are mighty, oh. Shebi Walo Fojwaru Shashabura. Oloru Agbaye, oh, you are Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Everybody read Romans chapter 8, verse 14 together. One, two, three. Go for as many as are led, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And this scripture is very famous. You've read it before, you've seen it before, you've heard it before. And it is true, we can come out and say, because we are the sons of God, we should expect the leading of the Holy Spirit in the everyday, day-to-day -day activities of our lives. What to wear, who to date, what to eat, where to drive to, where to school, who to marry, all of those things, we can expect the leading of God because we are the sons of God. But this scripture actually has a different context. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Everybody read Romans 8, 12 together, want to go. 
Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Okay, now, he's saying therefore, and I will always say that when you're doing your Bible study and you see the word therefore, you find out what it is there for. Do you understand? Because there was a context that led up to that statement. So when he says, therefore, brethren, it means based on what I have just said, this other thing I'm about to say. So what did he just say? Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, are you following? Then he that raised Christ from the dead will also do what? Will also do what? All right, so now he's talking about the work of the Spirit in the believer. And he says, if the Spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he that raised Christ from the dead will also do what? Quicken your mortal bodies. Therefore, on this knowledge, on the strength of this information, based on what you have just found out, he says, you are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Which means that because of the Spirit of God, do you understand? The debt you owe to the flesh has been paid. Now you, have a, you owe a different kind of debt. He says, you are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Verse 13, he says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall do what? You shall do what? Good. Now, he now says, but if you through who? If you through who? If, you, if um, ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall So based on the information that if the spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies. You then know that you can put to death this flesh because there is a life that he has given to you. Are you getting this? So if you through the spirit do mortify or do deaden the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Then the next, everybody read the next verse together once ago. For as many as are led. So what will be this leading that he is referring to here? That you through the spirit can mortify the deeds of the flesh. Are you following this? Do you follow? So what exactly is the leading of the spirit in this context? Is it, oh God, I want to buy a car. Should I buy a brown one or a white one? And then God says, hmm, white is the color of holiness. Buy white. Is that what, he, is that what the leading of the spirit is? No, not really. Can we trust God though in that way? Yes, we can. But is that what this scripture is talking about? No, not really. What is the scripture teaching us? It's teaching us that because we have the Holy Spirit, he can lead us in such a way that we can mortify the deeds of our flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's very unlike in the Old Testament where they used water to purify themselves outward. The presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you can help you regulate do you understand? It can help you set the pace for the way your life should go as, as it pertains to living after the flesh or not. Do you get it? Uh -huh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Are you there? Everybody read Galatians 5, 16 together. One, two, go. He says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and what? Verse 17. For, if, for the flesh lusteth after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Everybody read verse 18 together. One, two, go. But if you are led by the Spirit. Do you see the same context here? Verse 16. Walk in the Spirit that you may not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. He talks about how the flesh is warring against the Spirit. Listen, let me tell you something. As it pertains to your salvation, there is a knowledge that must drive your commitment to abstain from sin. The knowledge is not God will be angry if I sin. Do you hear me? It doesn't help. Amen. In fact, it does more harm than good. Many of you know what I'm saying. 
You've been in that situation where there is a, maybe you're struggling with an addiction or you're struggling with something that you don't want to do. You really love God and you really want to be there for God and, you know, live your life for God. But there are just certain things that in your, you are struggling with. And so you have been told God is angry. How can somebody give his life for you and then you'll be, you'll be treating him this way? You know, all those petty Hollywood-like movies that we act in our minds. And then we say all of those things. And then the devil knows. Because the devil now knows that, ah, this way I will catch you. So you do it the first time. You say, God, I'm very sorry. You do it the second time. God, I'm very sorry. After a while, you just tell yourself, that, see, God, this is the way I am, I beg. <laughs> am I saying the truth? Yes, sir. I can't change myself. No! The knowledge that must sponsor your consecration is this. That by the Spirit, I can put to death the things of the flesh. Yes. It's different now. That it's not in my own power, it's not in my own mind, but it's by the Spirit of the living. Do you get it now? Yes. yes. That the Holy Spirit can regulate my desires. He, he can, how Paul puts it in Philippians is that God is working in me to will and to do. Are you getting it? He's working in me to will and to do. So it is really the work of the Spirit. You see that prayer life that you have been struggling to keep up with? Trust the Holy Spirit. Leave your struggles and just trust the Holy Spirit. That, see, Holy Spirit, see, I've tried. I've set an alarm. I've, I'm, I've done everything they say we should do. But the prayer life still is so far. Help me. And from nowhere, you will just start noticing it's 6 a.m. You wake up and there's a staring in your spirit to pray. This, this is no longer you stri- struggling. This is the Holy Spirit staring you up to pray. Then you now learn to recognize those little starings. It, it, it now goes beyond, oh, um, it's prayer time. I must ginger myself. I must bring myself to... No! Listen, the, the Christian life must be founded on dependence on the work of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. The Christian life must be founded solely on the dependence on the work of the Spirit. The fact that the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, so I can trust and depend on Him to get this part of my life sorted out, to get this one done, to make sure that this area works. So I've been struggling with sin. I've been struggling with this contradiction in my life. Instead of me to focus so much on the contradiction, and then because of my focus, I keep falling for it, What do I do? I focus on the Spirit. See, let me tell you something. One of the biggest mysteries that I have discovered in the body of Christ is how you can have a person who is struggling with, let me use pornography and masturbation because it's usually the most predominant addiction that people struggle with. And you can have a person who is struggling heavily with those things. And the person can spend years focusing on how to beat them, and he won't. But if he should just decide that I will no longer focus on how to beat them, but I'll focus on how to better my relationship with the Spirit of God, he will beat them. He will. It's, it's a mystery. That's okay. So instead of me to focus on, oh, okay, day, day 10 without, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm keeping score. No, instead of focusing on that, I now say, okay, I'm going to make sure that every day I put in one hour of prayer. Regardless of whether I fell for this addiction or not, I'll put in one hour of prayer, I'll put in one hour of Bible study. So now I'm keeping score day 10 of Bible study, day 10 of one hour of prayer. I promise you, with time, you would pause and say, hmm, I've not done this thing in a while. Interesting. That's the way God designed for it to be. Praise the Lord. Listen, God doesn't ask his children to do anything he hasn't enabled them to do. Do you hear what I'm saying? He says God is the one that is working in you to will. And the day, I, the day this scripture opened up in my mind, I was like, my God, this is armed robbery. This is scandalous. <laughs> that, okay, so you mean 
that in the Old Testament, I couldn't keep the laws. All the laws were too cumbersome for me. They were too much for me. I mean, have you read the Old Testament before? It's almost as if there's one new law waiting around the corner for you to just do something. You're like, hmm, I didn't know this was a law. Don't shave your head in this way, but make sure you shave it in this other way. Don't wear this kind of clothing, but you can wear this kind of clothing under these particular circumstances. But even under these particular circumstances, if this is happening, don't wear it. At some point, you're like, what do you want from me? But then you come into the New Testament, and then God says, you know what? I am walking in you to will. So now, God solves two problems, or he kills two birds with a stone. In the Old Testament, it was a struggle desiring God, let alone keeping his commandments. It was a struggle. But in the New Testament, that desire, that will to keep his commandments, he says he's working in you to do it. That is, he's, he's producing the will to long after him in you by himself. That is such a beautiful thing. And then not only is he working in me to will, he's working in me to do. So now, you know, we did a teaching series in church in December on the leading. And I, I explained how that because of the Holy Spirit, one of the ways you can discern God's leading in your life is there are just certain things that you don't know where the passion for the thing came from. It's just there, and it has refused to go anywhere. Sometimes that's God. Do you know what I mean? You look at yourself after salvation, and you look at yourself before salvation, and then you wonder, honestly, raise your hand if this has ever happened. You look at the things you used to do before you became saved, and then you wonder, what was I thinking? <laughs> How did this look nice to me? You don't get it. And this is, this is why it is such a big miracle. Many of us don't realize it until we stop and, and think. You don't realize how much you have changed. Salvation is such a powerful experience. I mean, you could have somebody, his exam season, day one of the exam, you were not saved, you cheated in the exam anyhow. Day two of the exam, morning devotion, you gave your life to Christ. You... Two hours later, you went into an exam, and what was normal, you had format of the cheating, where to put the paper, where to write it. What was normal, when you bring out that paper, you start to feel, I shouldn't be doing this. Salvation is such a unique experience. It changes you like that, and that's the work of the Spirit. So before we ask people, um, brother, live a holy life, we must first of all teach them that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. The Spirit that makes holy is in you. So what we're asking you to do is not something that you cannot do. It's something that you already can because of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And then number three is what? Sealing and assurance. We're going to read um, some scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. The salvation package is such... How many of you watch superhero movies? Raise your hand. I'm a superhero fan. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I used to be a DC fan, but then they fell my hand, so now uh, I'm a Marvel fan. <laughs> I'm a Marvel guy now. All right. And in superhero movies, you have all these characters that are many times termed OP, overpowered. And that's because there is nothing that actually ever gets them defeated. The salvation package is like that. When you think very carefully about the salvation plan, and all that it entails, you realize that, man, God really thought this thing through. Do you understand? He really thought it through. It wasn't a fluke. It was an accident. He knew what he was doing. So man fell. Man was in sin. Man couldn't help himself. So God sent his laws so that man could see his frailty 
And man tried for so many years to keep those laws to no avail. Do you understand? You don't get it. The laws were not given to be kept. You, you don't understand. The laws were given to prove that you can't keep them. Maybe you don't get it. A lot of people will always say, eh, how to make heaven, keep the Ten Commandments, and God is laughing. Say for here, this Ten Commandments that me I gave you. <laughs> oh yeah, try, let me watch you. I, th I think this is where the problem is. You, 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 you are trying to go to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Now, here's the annoying part. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. I want you to open Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Are you there? If you're there, say praise the Lord. If you're not there, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Notice how they were the loudest. <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Are you there now? Yes, sir. All right. Everybody read Romans 3, 19 together. One, two, go. So, first of all, that was why the law was given, right? So that every mouth may be stopped. You know that situation where, um, um, the example I would always give, you are a tutorial teacher, but there is this one ITK, I too know, that really doesn't know. And so, you want, before you said A, B, C, they've gone to Z, and you're like, no, that's not correct. And then they refuse to learn because they don't know what they don't know. So you as a teacher, you now say, okay, you know what, here's a sheet of paper. If you answer these questions, then I know that you know what you're saying. If you don't answer them, then keep quiet, let me teach you. He says, the laws were given so that every mouth may be stopped and all men will be held guilty before God. So you can then see that, oh, we've wronged him. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. But verse 20. Everybody read 20 together, one to go. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall... Oh, okay. So, are you saying that even if I successfully, somehow by crook or by hook, keep all 10 commandments, I'm still not justified before God? That's the part that many people don't understand. This... Heavenly race that we run so much by trying to keep all the commandments. The Bible says don't lie. So I try my best not to lie. And you should. You ought to. Do you understand? Don't steal. You ought to try your best not to steal. I mean, I don't need to tell you to try your best not to kill. Because I, I think that's a no-brainer. <laughs> not just because God doesn't like it, but they will arrest you. And so you try your best to keep all of these laws, but understand something at the back of your mind. That even after I have kept all of these laws, before God, I am not justified though. So it's like we think, or some people think that when we stand before God, the conversation would then be, why are you here? And then the person would look to God and say, hmm, I see what you were trying to do, but I beat you. <laughs> I kept all the laws, all of them. Ten of them. And then God is like, so that's good for you, but you're not saved. This, this is a conversation that needs to be had. You know, when people say, how about all the moral monks, you know, the, um, what they call them monks, the monasteries. Morality has never, salvation eh, has never been by morality. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. Morality is not the yardstick for measuring salvation. Do you hear me? Okay. I know this is so hard for some people to understand. So now, because I already said at the beginning that your attitude to, to knowledge should be different. So you, in your mind, you are saying, are you now saying that? But then you now have this conundrum in your head that, ah, I said we should not say, are you now saying that? So does thou now say... <laughs> Morality has never been the yardstick for salvation. It has never been. Nobody was ever saved because he was moral enough. How do you want to stand before the thrice holy God and claim moral? Who are you? 
He wrote the guidelines for morality. At best, you are just keeping to his standards. At best. How does that put you on the same level with him? It takes more than morality. It takes the spirit of God to be saved. So let me say this. There are many saved people who are not as moral as they should be. And many unsaved people who are extremely moral. And on the last day, the morality of both sides will not count for anything. <laughs> of course, salvation does affect morality. Do you get that? I, I did this entire teaching on how God is working in you to will and to do. Salvation does affect morality. But make no mistakes. Morality has never been the guideline. It has never been the marking scheme. Do you understand? Yes. Just like proper English language is never the marking scheme in a mathematics exam. Do you understand? I might write so fluently in the, I mean, use big words like lugubrious and uh, dismal pismal. Use all those huge words in the maths exam. It won't matter if I didn't get the questions right. Yeah. Do you get it? Yes. And I think, because many people don't realize this, we approach the subject of salvation very haphazardly. Very haphazardly. You know, some people say things like, eh, I will just flex when I'm about to die. <laughs> Have you heard people say that before? I'll just do God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me, and then God will forgive me. And <laughs> First of all, you don't know when you're going to die. You are assuming that you'll be on a hospital bed. Oh, I'm sorry, some people die from motor accidents. One minute you were fine, next minute you are dead. So what do you now do when, when you are sitting in front of heaven's gates? You're like, Where am I? Heaven. Can you give me one minute? <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, the work of the Spirit, number three, sealing and assurance. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. Everybody read Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 together, one to go. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here's something that happened. He says, when you believed, he says, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Have you ever bought a um, have you ever bought um, a product that has a seal on it? Have you ever bought that before? Where they would ask you, they would say, "Do not buy if the seal is broken." The seal is the manufacturer's promise of integrity. Do you understand? The seal is, is the manufacturer's assurance of quality. Do you get it? Good. The Bible tells us that when we believed, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God so much trust in, um, trusted in his ability to save that he gave us a promise, a seal of promise. Actually, the idea that Paul was borrowing from is this thing that used to happen in ancient times. You must have seen it in one of these ancient movies where the king used to have a ring on his hand with this particular seal on it. The seal was indicative of his dynasty and his kingdom. So when you see that seal, it was like a logo. When you see that seal, you know, okay, this belongs to this king. And so what they would do is he would write a letter, for instance, and then fold the letter, dip, dip, put the ring in hot wax, and they use it to seal the, the letter. Is that correct? And now, this is the interesting thing. Until that letter was 
delivered to who it was intended for. It was a crime to break the seal. The, the king's seal must never be broken until it gets to its final destination. That's what Paul was borrowing from. How that when God saved us, he sealed us with the spirit until we get to the final destination. Do you get this? Do you get this? So, the only time we should conceive a life without God, ironically, is when we are finally with him. Because as long as we are here, and we have received the Holy Spirit, he has sealed us. Do you get it? Verse 14. He says, um, so speaking about the Holy Spirit of promise, he says, which is the earnest? Do I have anybody reading from the NIV? What does it say? He says, which is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance? So, Paul borrows from two concepts now. The first is the seal, the king. The next one is deposits. Have you ever gone to the market to buy something you want? Or maybe it was your wedding day. And um, you know you, you know how we just have vendors and then we, we, we pay deposits just to book the day? Has that ever happened? Now, does it ever so happen that on the day of the wedding, you will now call the vendor and say, I gave you 100K, ba." Say yes. Can you help me send it back? I'm not, do you know the kind of fights that you will fight? <laughs> right? Good. He says he's the deposit. Some translations like NLT say he's the down payment. He's the deposit that guarantees your inheritance. What is this inheritance? God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Now this is the interesting thing. We're all going to die. Is that correct? We're all going to die. Except Jesus comes now. We're all going to die. Which means that the perish or the die that was spoken about in John chapter 3 verse 16 goes beyond physical death. Is that true? Good. So now there is an inheritance of a life after death, an eternal life that stands waiting for the believer in the horizon. And then we, we are here. We, we are still divided or separated from that by physical death. But God made us a promise. Do you understand? That I have promised you eternal life, and here's my proof. I've put my spirits within you so that if he that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then he that raised Christ from the dead will also with him quicken, give life to your mortal bodies. Do you understand? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He calls him the earnest, the deposit, the down payment, the deposit that guarantees your inheritance until the redemption of the possessed possession. Of the purchased possession. So, I, I, I shed my blood to pay for you. You were under the slavery and mastery of sin. I shed my blood, died to give you your own place. And now you are mine. But I haven't called you to myself yet because there's still so much you need to do right here. But here's my promise that regardless of what happens here, you are mine. I put my spirit inside of you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, there is a, there's a level of safety, a mindset of safety that the believer must come to knowing, I have the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. You know how, you know there's this thing that happens, is it happens in every Nigerian home unspoken, especially if you live alone. You call a workman to your house. Let's say you want the carpenter to work for you, right? And then the carpenter comes with his tools to your house, right? But now he has to go and buy materials. And then he bills you 40K for materials. And this is 40K you worked hard for. Amen. So now you don't know this carpenter from Adam. So you give him the 40K, right? And you tell him, go and come back. But your safety and assurance is that he left his tools behind. Amen. And so we just do this mental calculation that in the tools, everything is like go past 40K. So you can go. Is that correct? Christ is coming back for his spirit. Do you understand? So songs like when you come to collect your people, remember me, unnecessary. <laughs> unnecessary. Do you get it? Unnecessary. 
it is the spirit in you he's coming back for. Do you understand? So when he comes, he will take that spirit and carry you and go. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 to 22. Are you there? He says, now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Verse 22, everybody wants to go. Who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our... So now he's saying the same exact thing in another place. So in case when he was writing to the church in Ephesus, they were like, what is this guy saying? This is new. When he got to Corinth, he said it again. Then it is, they will now tell Ephesus. I, I also wrote it to Corinth, so go and read their letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Now, he that hath wrought for us, the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the down payment of the Spirit. The reason why I'm taking you through all of these scriptures is this. The next time the devil wants to come and tell you that God has forsaken you and he has abandoned you, you have a wealth of scriptures to return back to. He has given you down payments are non-refundable. Do you get it? So he's not going to ask for a refund that I gave you my spirit returning back to me. So David in the Old Testament, this down payment, David didn't have it. Because the Holy Spirit was not living in anybody until Christ came and died. And so David had the Spirit come upon him at certain times. Do you understand? So at certain times, he would feel the Holy Ghost come upon him. He would prophesy. He would play. He would know, oh, the Holy Spirit has come upon me. And so when he was writing Psalm, I think it was 35 or 51, where he said, cast me not away from your presence, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. He was writing in a different context. It doesn't apply to you. Do you get it? Ah, down payments are not refundable. So if God says he wants, you can argue. So for here, this spirit, I oh know, he's not going anywhere. You have given him to me. You promised me. I mean, how ridiculous would it be? I know it happens, but how ridiculous is it that I, I call a lady and I tell her, I want to marry you. And I give her a ring that I want to marry you. Just hold on, we'll do this thing together. Then after like two weeks, I'm not going to call her my ring back. I know it happens, but it's ridiculous. When God promised us marriage, he gave us his spirit. He's not taking him anywhere. Do you get this? Yes, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. It says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. The Holy Spirit is really your seal. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 Verse number six. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Did, did, um, did, were you asked to write down your prayer points and prayer requests in a sheet of paper? Do you have those written out? How many of you don't have it written out? Raise your hand if you don't. All right, I'm just going to give you some 30 seconds. You know, not 30 seconds. Between now and when the teaching is over, I want you to write them out. I want you to write them out. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, Philippians, did I say Ephesians? Philippians 1, 6. Are you there? Thank you, Lord Jesus. He says, being, you know what? Everybody read Philippians 1, 6 together. I want to go. Be confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will do what? Will do what? There is a mindset that the apostles want you to have, and it is this. Getting to heaven is not actually a display of how good you are, but how powerful he is. If a believer doesn't go to heaven, 
we oftentimes think that what happens is if a believer doesn't go to heaven, then it's a tell on how the believer failed in believing. No. If a believer doesn't make it to heaven, the failure is on God. Do you hear me? He says, being confident of this very thing, that the one who began this work, he says he will perform it. All I need to do is trust. Just watch and trust. The one that started the work will perform it. Do you hear me? He will perform it. Jude 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present. Listen, when Paul wrote this scripture, you know, many times we have this mindset that when he was writing this scripture, he did not know how bad things were going to get. Amen. He did not know how bad things were going to get. That man, if Paul was in our time, he would not write the scripture. With all the things that are going on left and right on social media, everywhere, if Paul was in our time, it's not the scripture. He will not, uh-uh, that he does. No, he will tell you to perform it because the times are evil. You do realize, though, that we just read from 2 Corinthians, is that correct? And we read um, chapter 1 and we read chapter 5 where Paul talked about the Holy Spirit as our down payment, you do realize that it was in the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians that first of all, there were Christians sleeping with prostitutes in the Corinthian church. Then there was this guy in the Corinthian church who was in an open relationship with his father's wife. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was to these people Paul wrote that the Holy Spirit is your down payment. Pastor, are you not giving people a license to sin? Number one, people never needed a license to sin. Do you get it? And then secondly, and more importantly, the solution to sin never lied in your ability. The solution to sin lied in the ability of the Holy Ghost. And that solution is made more effective when you realize it's not going anywhere. Is that true? Yes. It says, being confident... Of this very thing, he that has begun a good work, he says he will perform it. Say he will perform it. Say he will perform it. Listen, I know that you have read that scripture before, and maybe in your mind, what you were thinking is God started working a miracle in your life, he's able to perform that miracle, and it's completely true. That, oh, God that has started me in 100 level, he will see me through to 400 level with a first class. It's sometimes true because we still fail. But the proper context of that scripture is that the one who brought you into salvation is able to take you from the first day you were saved till the day you finally meet the object of your desire. Do you get it? So our boast is in Christ Jesus. Our boast is in his work. Say assurance of salvation. salvation. You can be so sure you are saved. Listen, hear me. You can be so sure you are saved that regardless of the contradictions you see in your life, you still have, you are still able to maintain a healthy relationship with God. A lot of people think that God shies away from your mistakes. No! When Paul was writing to Jude, or Jude was writing Jude, where he says, um, being confident um, that he is able to keep you from falling, Jude took into consideration the fact that we all make mistakes. Do you get it? He's able to keep you from falling and present you blameless. It's either these people were delusional or they had tapped into some type of knowledge and higher grace that we don't yet understand. That you mean, because we all know ourselves. Amen. We all know how wicked we are, really. All of us have those thoughts that we, we, are, we are ashamed to say outside. Less people think that we are of the devil. And then Jude says that God is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless. So not only did he keep you from falling, I mean, it's different when, it's different, you know, when he kept you from falling, then finally you get into heaven and you're going to be like, wow, wow, you are here. Exactly, remain small. You remain, it's just your salvation now. 70% was the cutoff mark, but you are like, you had 71%. Or you even, the 70% that brought you here, God. <laughs> if I kept you alive for one more day. Ah. You know, it's different 
when that's the case. But he says he's able to keep you from falling and present you blame. So when you get to heaven, even if 70% was the cutoff mark, when God sees you, he will say, oh, this is 100%. It's completely clean. Despite of all your frailty and all your flaws, man, that's scandalous. <laughs> Do you understand? That? That's scandalous. Say assurance of salvation. Yes. You can be so sure as a Christian that, listen, listen. You ask a believer, so when you die, where will you go? You say, or you ask, when you die, are you going to heaven? Only God knows, oh. Only God, you don't get it. God wants you to more than say that. He wants you to be able to say, yes, I'm going to heaven. Yes. And then, you know, when, when people ask, and I say, yes, I'm going to heaven, and they're like, uh-uh, are you that pure? I'm saying, no, me, pure, no. But I have the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Do you get it? I have the Holy Spirit. I can, trust, I can trust that one. In fact, the one factor that I can trust above everything else is the Holy Spirit in me. Me, if it was me alone, I'm sure I'm not going to heaven. It's not. You know how I'm sure now because of the Holy Spirit. If you take away the Holy Spirit, I'm sure. I have assurance of hellfire. <laughs> it's true. How do you want to do it? How? How do you want to do it? Go to heaven without the Holy Ghost? How? You know yourself. Many of you don't understand what sin is. So there's a, there's a theological branch called hamatology. Hematology is the doctrine of sin. And this is something many people don't realize that the difference between offending your brother or offending your friend and offending God is so great that if I stole my brother's pen, right, he might be upset. But because of a factor called time, that feeling will win over time. Do you get it? So at some point, it no longer makes sense for him to be upset with me for stealing his... Does that make sense? Even if I never replaced the pen or apologized. But because God lives outside of time, if you steal his pen today, you stole it next year. Does it make sense? So you do realize that what you think is your sin today before God is not sin today is an eternal sin. Is it dawning on you now? It's an eternal sin. So, you know how we now say eh, his messages are new every morning. They are, so, every day, we are, mm-mm. He does not operate that way. Offense doesn't register the same way. So, how do you want to go to heaven without the Holy Ghost? Because, honest to God, the very first sin you ever committed is enough. Is plenty enough. Because that one registers till the day you are dead. Like, when you now stand before God, it's not like, you know, I think we have the wrong picture. So we stand before God, and we think that what is going to happen is, he will now look, then they will now open, now play home video. You were born October 30th, 1992. You became 10 years October 30th, 2002. At 10 years old, you lied. October 30th. Look at it. We gave you 10 years of grace. Maybe pay less. You find your footing. But look at you. You stole from your mother's pot, which first of all is a crime. Then she now asked you who took it. If you had told her that it was you, would have considered. But you lied. Look at it. Look at it. Is this not you? You know, that's what we think is going to happen. You don't realize it. That when you stand before God, it's not going to be October 30th. It's, you are a liar. You are a thief. You don't have honor. So you stole meat. You are stealing meat. You are a thief. You still steal meat. Do you get it? There's no past, present, and future. Before God, time doesn't exist. But now, God took what would have been a disadvantage and turned it into an advantage. Because just as time doesn't exist, the forgiveness he provided on the cross is not time bound. Do you get this now? So when he died for you 2,000 years ago, he died for you 2,000 years to come. Do you get it? Yeah. So there is forgiveness for what you are doing tomorrow. Do you understand? Say assurance of salvation. It's the work of the Holy Ghost. John chapter 6. 
37 to 40. John chapter 6, 37 to 40. Are you there? That's just like one person. Are you there? Look at this. It says, All that the Father has given to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Who is speaking? How many of you have words of Christ in red? So you know it's Jesus that's speaking, right? Good. Verse 38. He says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He says, And this is the Father's will which he had sent me, that all of which, of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing. I should lose how many? I should lose how many? Hey, I should lose how many? Nothing. Are you part of those that God yes. gave? Uh, so he will lose how many? Are you part of this number that he will not lose? All right. He says, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. All that God gave to Christ, he won't lose any on the last day. You know, you've heard this statement before. The last day is going to be full of many surprises. And many people make those statements because they will not follow it. Many people who expect to be in heaven will not be there. I know. I, I truly do believe that the last day will be full of surprises, but this is a surprise. Many people you don't expect to be there. You will check in and you say, Are you? You! He says, you will, He will lose nothing. Praise the Lord. Verse 40. And he says, And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him read the next line together once to go may have everlasting life and i will raise him how many people did he say everyone see he didn't say everyone who saith the son and then you keep yourself pure and then you try your best strive because man this heavenly race is really hard strive he said everyone who seeth the son he says, I will give him eternal life. He says, I will keep him and I will raise him on the last day. If Jesus didn't mean this, he was being careless. Who? He was being careless. You can't make this kind of a promise. John chapter 17. John chapter 10, rather, not 17. 27 to 30. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are reading John 10, 27. You know what? From verse 25, just for effect. He says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. So those that don't believe are not his sheep. Which means that those who believe are his sheep. Do you follow this? Good. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Meaning those who believe hear my voice. Amen. Amen. This is an important teaching on the leading of God. He didn't say, my sheep when they grow will hear my voice. No. Part of the, part of the advantages of believing in God is that you will hear his voice. You will know. The problem is many of us have not been trained to discern. But he, when he speaks, you know. You know, the something told me that we always say as Christians. The, I had this feeling in my heart and I don't know, I couldn't shake it off. The, I had a dream and it was significant. I woke up and I knew it meant something. The sheep hear his voice. They really do. But that's not what I'm teaching this morning. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Verse 28. And I give unto them what? I give unto them what? And they shall never... Now, read the next line together. One, two, go. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29. My father which gave them to me is greater than all. And no man. Are you a man? Are you a man? I'm speaking about man generically now, not a gender. Are you a man? Can you pluck yourself out of the father's hand? Uh -huh. He says, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen, you know, people would always castigate you. Say, how can you teach assurance of salvation? 
How can you teach eternal security and eternal salvation? How can you not? How do, what do you do with verses like this when you read them? You just jump over them. Like, Jesus, I hear what you're saying, but let's talk about something else. Is that what, you, is that what you're going to do? Listen, it is such a good gift that we can boast, we can actually confidently boast that eternal life is real. And not only is it real, we have an all-access pass to it that cannot be revoked. Man, when it comes to this humanity thing, we've truly won. Do you get it? Because all men die, whether they like it or not. All men die. I, 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 I debated an atheist once. This was a long time ago, I think 2014. And then the guy was telling me that what if he doesn't want eternal life? I said, you don't get it, young man. You will die. <laughs> and see, that carpenter's son from um, Galilee has implicated you. You know how the entire class wrote a test and then 90% of the class was complaining that the test was hard. The one traitor now scored 70 over 70. That traitor that scored 70 over 70 has implicated the rest of the class. Because the teacher will now say, if one person could do it, you can do it too. If Jesus was raised from the dead and he was, ah, he has implicated humanity. Because the man said, I will die. After three days, I will come back from the dead. You know this saying in Yoruba that if a man tells you that he wants to dash with a shirt, you look at the one he's wearing. If anybody promises you life after now, you have to find out, have you been there before? Have you, have you seen it? Because this is a very ridiculous claim. But this guy now comes and says, I will die, don't worry. I've not been there, but shortly I will, I will, I will run him. And so he dies, and three days later, he's back from the dead to give you all this fantastic news about what he saw there. Man, he has implicated humanity. It's no longer a question of I don't want eternal life or not. Because when all men die, we're now faced with that decision. There was someone who created us, we're all held accountable to him. And when we stand before God, he's not going to say, were you moral or were you not moral? He's not going to ask whether you paid your tithes or you gave offering. All of those things matter, but not where salvation is concerned. Do you understand? They matter, but not where salvation is concerned. Paul was speaking about Abraham. He said, what, what can we say about Abraham? He said, Abraham had many things to boast of, but not before God. How do you want to boast before God? What do you want to say to him? That God, while I was alive, man, the country was terrible. People were bad, left, right, and center. But you see me, I kept myself. I fell one or two times, but I kept myself. And then God is like, so what? How do you want to boast before God? The only thing that makes salvation good news is that number one, it is free. Number two, it is easy to access. And number three, when you access it, it doesn't go anywhere. Praise the Lord. Your salvation is not like your subscription plan that you renew. That, oh, your, sub your salvation is valid until your next offense. It's not. It is valid beyond your next offense. Do you, in fact, it is more valid when the offense has been committed. Do you get it? The Bible says where sin abides, it says grace abounds much more. Do you get it? It says it's much more. It says it's much more. If I owed, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. If what I owed was 10,000 naira, grace comes with 10 million naira and says, do you still need more? Do you understand it? Yes. So your, your, your salvation is not like a subscription plan that you renew all the time. So you wake up in the morning, Father, everywhere that I have sinned, sins of commission, sins of omission, sins of deletion, sins of whatever sin, forgive me, sins unknowingly and un unknowing and unknowing. Then the next morning you wake up and then they say, the messes are new every morning. So we must confess and ask for the same forgiveness again today. What happens when you commit sins that you didn't even know and you don't get the opportunity to say sins that I committed knowingly and unknowingly? What happens? What happens? Oh, you don't know that there are sins that you commit that you don't even know are sins? You don't know. You don't know. There are. There are. I can tell you some. 
Raise your hand in this room if you drive. Put your hand up above your head. Keep your hand up if you've ever driven one way before. Did you confess that sin to God that God, I'm so sorry, I drove one way today. Did you? So what happens when you drive, especially when there's no, in, in Abuja, I think it's VIO that holds people. So there's no VIO to catch you. So you successfully drive the one way to your destination. And you know when you finish, you feel like a bad guy. Like, yes, I've done it. And you forget about it. And then you, get, you don't get the opportunity to say things of commission, things of omission. You know, there was this very, very funny movie that they used to do when we were much younger. And there was, we've all heard the story. There was one man. He lived holy. He tried his best to please God. But one day his wife annoyed him. He got angry at her. He called her a fool. Then he stormed out of the house. And then moto jammed him. Then he died. Then he, he got to heaven's gate and he was about to enter. And then Peter's um, angel, uh, Peter's not an angel. Michael looked at his records and said, you've done well. But you called your wife a fool. Go to hell. How can you claim that that God is good? How? How can you really claim that that God is good? That a man abstained, kept himself, did all, and then one mistake doomed him to eternal punishment. He, do you know what eternity means? Do you know what eternity means? Eternity is not one million years old. One million years is a blip on the scheme of things where eternity, and none of us knows what one million years looks like. The oldest person you know, probably a hundred and something years old, did not even started eternity. That's like... Introduction to eternity. We'll just do introduction for 100 years. Preamble. So because you made a mistake, you were crossing the road, you called her a fool. Or, very, very common, if you grew up in Lagos or you live in Lagos like I did or do, this one is very common. You saw Nathan, Pastor Nathaniel Bassi sharing the story of when he was driving and praying in tongues and somebody, and then he was speaking in tongues. And it was... <laughs> It is his reflex in Lagos. It's reflex. It's very, I have to catch myself. I'm serious. I have to. This, this thing is reflex. Especially on the road when you are driving. Somebody just do something. <laughs> and you know, you lean forward and let it catch you where you are going. So you finish that. And then prior, that's your last minute. You now get to heaven. Your hand is still like this. <laughs> you do? The only thing that makes salvation good news is that it is free, it is easy to receive, and above all, it's not going anywhere. That it takes into account your frailty. It takes into account your mistakes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I've taken time to do this teaching because If you have, you can come for a miracle service and you will receive miracles left, right, and center. But if the foundation of your salvation is not sorted out, the devil will, he will lead you into massive condemnation. He will. He will lead you into massive condemnation. A lot of people have left the church on this basis. Condemnation. And so you make a mistake and you want to pray and then all of us have experienced this one before. You've done something wrong, then you want to pray. And then the moment you kneel down, the devil will say, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You are kneeling down. I hope it's not prayer you want to pray. You want to pray. You. What you did yesterday or 10 minutes ago, you want to pray. Don't you know the prayer of a sinner is an abomination? Not to, you know the devil is very good at quoting scripture. Then you now start to think to yourself that, man, it's true. How can I truly pray? How can I truly talk to God with the, I've done, with the things I've done? Listen, let me tell you something. The prayer of a sinner is an abomination unto God. It doesn't apply to you. Because a sinner is not the sheep of God. Do you get it? 
the sheep become sheep once they believe. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Once they believe they are sheep. At that moment, any prayer they make is not this. Do you get it? Yeah. Otherwise, how does the prayer of salvation work? Have you ever thought about it before? If the prayer of a sinner is, ab- is an abomination unto God, then how come when a sinner says, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, I accept, it's not, that one is not an abomination. It's not an abomination because the prayer was not necessary to save him, really. We don't get saved when we pray prayer of salvation. We get saved when we believe in our hearts. The Bible says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto... So we are confessing something that has already happened inside the heart. So you did something wrong and the devil comes and he tells you the prayer of a sinner, stop praying. And then you get up from there and you refuse to pray. And he knows that when you don't pray, listen, the instruction is this, that let us come before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The context was, um, the writer of Hebrews was talking to unbelieving Jews, but it still applies to the believer. The context is this, or the, 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 the rule is this, that at your time of need, you approach God. Do you understand? You don't turn away at your most pressing time of need because of your need. What kind of a mother would she be if a mother turns away her child because he saw this diaper? And I say, go and clean that diaper before you come here. I can't see that it's smelling. I'm a neat mother. I don't, I don't. But that's what the devil does in our minds. God is holy. And if you must follow him, you must walk with him in holiness. So you come for miracle services like this, and you don't even feel like you should lift your hands and receive from God because you don't think you deserve it. You don't think you deserve to talk to God. You don't think you deserve to receive from God. And so every other person is praying with all of their hearts, and you look around and you're like, I wish I could do this. But where do I even begin from with God? Brother, sister, you can rest easy now. The Holy Spirit inside of you, he has put things on a clean slate. Do you, you are, I, no matter what time you call his name, you have his attention. Do you get what I'm saying? But pastor, you don't know the bad things I have done. You know do pass Paul the apostle. I can hit my chest. You know do pass Paul the apostle. The man was a murderer. He killed for fun. You know how hardened your heart has to be? That people gather Stephen and then they want to stone him. And then Stephen lifts his eyes to heaven and starts to proclaim this great vision that he sees. And this is something interesting that happens. His face begins to shine. Like literally, not figuratively. Because I don't know how somebody's face will shine figuratively. But literally, his face begins to glow. Now, because I'm a Nigerian, I will not stone that kind of a thing. And I think the other Jews, they, 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 like, they coded it. They looked at the guy and they dropped the stone. I said, Kai, God is really with this person. If we stone this guy, we're in trouble. And then Paul said, stone him. Let his blood be on my head and on my children. That's how hardened the guy was. It was this same Paul that wrote the scriptures that I quoted to you about the Holy Spirit. So, pastor, you don't know what I have done. You know, do pass Paul, though. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, you, do, you do not do more than Paul. You do not do more than Paul. So, we're going to go into a session of prayer, a very short session of prayer, before I make proclamations over your prayer requests. But what I want you to do in this session of prayer is, I want you to loosen your heart and actually allow your knowledge that you've just gained about the dealings of the Spirit, let it affect your relationship with God. Do you understand? So if you need to take time to say thank you for not condemning me, regardless of my flaws, regardless of my frailty, thank you for not condemning me, thank you for loving me, thank you for being my father, do that. Listen, God is not like Zexus, that he has to be holding the um, golden scepter up when you come, else he will smite you. No, this king is different. His door is always open, the throne is always accessible. All you need to do is call out to him. Stand up, let us pray. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Samanan tokobara di de bosai. A prata ba shelemento ko brata baleta. A fanamante kibele kurata mante kibari abalokata ya. 
Apele londo kia mane ko subelatish. Ezele ko parabato subrante kibos. Apele kande beso kia balatoa. E benenente kibara mante kile bahe. Ifala ko parabate. Thank you Lord Jesus. For your love and your kindness towards me. Thank you for not condemning me. Thank you for the work of the spirit. Thank you for the assurance of salvation that you have given to me. Thank you because I know that I am always where you are. Thank you because my presence is where you are. Where I go is where you go. I carry you about because your spirit lives inside of me. I can rest assured that I am not condemned. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lampeligu salaba ebrekoto subelekaya elemento ko subeleta aparabato ko sibe ifala parabato epelegute parabate efelemento ko propolota. Go ahead and pray. Hana manelo ko bolo ko shapalata. Aprete pele ko temeneta. Avelo ko prata balake. E balata te ko shibele mate. E prata ko te bere pele ta. Shibele te ko te pele ta ko pele ta. E menemeno bolo te ko pele ta. Ile managa deba. Sepeleta koparia balata Amane nemele kuperi de be subrata ba Epelela tada bo solena Ah ya bale kulo de ne mashap Hana mante ki baruta Father, I have come before you with all of these needs, with all of these desires. Jesus, touch me at the point of my need. Epatakolo pelata na malakata paripelata. Epatakana mat. 